Welcome to the Learning to Die podcast. I'm Ian Dunican. And I'm Kieran O'Regan. How do I live when I know I must die? We explore areas of philosophy, psychology, martial arts, culture, existential risk, history, society, religion, science, and anything else that seems of interest and relevance to answering that question. We can only hope that some of what we learn might be of benefit to you too. Namaste, sapiens. <laughs> Welcome back to the Learning to Die podcast. I should start this podcast with a yawn because it's so early for me. <laughs> so it's uh, six twenty here in the morning for me in Western Australia. Uh, I'm drinking a large coffee. Kieran, it's what time for you? 11.21. And what are you drinking? Beer. Beer. And Shane, Delicious. what time is it for you? What time is it for you in the US? It's 5.21 in Chicago, and I'm drinking some water. I'm drinking some water. So we have everything covered. <laughs> <laughs> every time zone, every every sort of liquid is covered. Excellent. Shane, thanks very much for coming on today. Um so let's uh let's give a bit of intros and background. For our guests who don't know who you are, Shane, can you um, describe who you are? And, and and I know this question is long because our answers might be a bit long and varied because you were on our Sleep for Performance podcast, but can you tell us about technically where you're from slash multiple locations? <laughs> <laughs> Serious identity crisis to get started yeah. with, right? That's it, yeah. So... <laughs> I'm based in Chicago, the USA right now. Whenever anyone says they're from a city in America, they usually name the city and expect people to know exactly where they're from. So I'm in the US right now, but I'm my great-grandparents were Portuguese. My parents were born in India because my great-grandparents settled there on the West Coast of India in Mumbai, formerly known as Bombay. And I was born in the US actually because my dad with an airline working as an airline executive would travel all over for a few years at a time and we'd move as a family and two younger sisters came along eventually and we kind of moved and lived in different places and grew and shared life experiences as families tend to do and I went on to do physical therapy in an undergrad and the U.S. usually needs to do a bachelor's degree before you go to med yeah. school so I did physical therapy, then I went to medical school and di did psychiatry and sports psychiatry and sleep medicine in Madison, Wisconsin. And I've been in Chicago working at the Amen Clinics, where we do integrative psychiatry and it's meeting point with functional brain imaging or spec imaging to map neurophysiology and neurobiology and have integrative approaches to mental health. So body health is brain health, brain health is mental health. And taking that further in the sports world, I work with sleep optimization to boost sports performance in the sports world. So that in summary in a nutshell is what I do. And I had such a great, great, great time speaking with you, Ian, on your podcast that we went down all these amazing rabbit holes and yeah. a long discussion after the podcast. And we said, well, there's so much more that needs to be spoken about. It's not just medications for psychiatry. It's not just CBT for therapy, but there's so much more under the surface that mm -hmm. we're missing collectively as humanity, but also especially this point in our lives with further divergence between who we are at our core, our roots, psychologically, subconsciously, and consciously, and where we're going. If we don't have a sense of where we are, where we've come from, we're not going to have a sense of direction in terms of where to go and build a purpose. So thank you so much for having me, guys. Excited to be here. Thanks, Jen. I think that's a that's a nice overview. I suppose um just for clarification, when we're when we're getting into um when we're getting into like purpose and meaning, just from the outset, can you do you mind saying um, cause this will be the focus of our conversation, you know, what your, your Christian f affiliation is in terms of religion and, and why you are, why you are this. 
<laughs> I asked myself that question all my life, Ian. It's yeah. it's been a journey. I was born into a Catholic family, and I was baptized and christened, and uh, got my first Holy Communion. We'd go to church on Sunday or Saturday, and when I was maybe 12 or 13 years old, I said, just because I was born into a Catholic family, does, that doesn't mean I have to be Catholic, yeah. right? So why it's being shoved on to me so i never got confirmed i'm still not confirmed actually i oh, really told you oh we'll have to stop this confirmed. podcast karen let's stop this podcast this this can't this can't proceed oh, no i'm being banished are you going to cancel me now <laughs> oh, hold on a minute let's let's just ask the question before we go any further karen have you been confirmed yeah oh that's all right god i got nervous there we'll let this one go all right sorry Shane. Well, i'm the only unconfirmed one here okay <laughs> fine Sweet. thanks thank you for having me on i appreciate it <laughs> <laughs> she so I, I, unconfirmed I read, yeah unconfirmed unacceptable cannot be married in the catholic church when eventually i do find the lady i i get it i get it uh <laughs> so i i started reading i started reading uh hinduism philosophy spirituality existentialism i trained in past life regressive hypnosis i i read extensively and the common themes i found in terms of modern spirituality are already based in Christianity. It's just different labeling and words. And, you know, we can go on looking at parallels throughout, throughout the Bible in metaphors and parables that Jesus taught in and how those things manifest in universal archetypes that Carl Jung spoke about. Hmm. And how, how the Bible is basically a roadmap to life itself and how powerful it can be if we choose to take those learnings so i think the thing that disillusioned me about christianity on the whole was the fact that through the ages various institutions tried to manipulate the word of god in order to control the masses and that is what rubbed me the wrong way so you know I believe it was Thomas Jefferson who put it really, really, really well in, in that regard. He, he said that something so pure and beautiful as, as the Bible has been manipulated to, to control and, and deceive. And that's what kind of put me off Christianity initially. But then looking at where we are now, I say, great, let's dig deeper. The Bible should not be taken literally word for word, but in terms of metaphors and parables. And if you think about metaphors, guys, the best way to tap into the unconscious mind is through metaphors. You look at hypnosis, hypnotic techniques involve metaphors, visualizations. So it basically strikes at our very core of being. Carl Jung spoke about the fact that we're not conscious beings who, and there's a little subsection, like a closet in, in the wall of the unconscious, but we, in fact, are buds that emerge out of the unconscious itself, like buds on a tree with the trunk being universal consciousness. Mm. I think the same archetypes play recurrently in different aspects of the Bible. And when we understand the Bible in those terms, it becomes incredibly powerful in terms of everything we need to interpret in terms of our modern day lives and what we can hope for and, and the struggles and why life may seem unfair at times. I think Jordan Peterson is someone yeah. who has really taken these motifs, these archetypes, these symbols, these <clears throat> metaphors, these parables, and put it into something that's very tangible for us to consume. So a classic, exa a classic example, I, I really resonate with what you're saying there, uh, Shane. And a classic example is, and Karen, you might know of this story as well. I think a classic example, what you're saying is so true in terms of like how stories can be a vehicle like a trojan horse for lessons of life because we all know if you put down a book in front of someone like a technical manual they're not going to read a word for it and remember it but you tell a story or you do a movie like the avengers and we see this hero as hero's journey constantly happening like with joseph campbell these stories are vehicles they're like um like i said a trojan horse or a missile into the future for telling these stories like a classic one is in Ireland, in this place called Newgrange, which is about 5,000 years old now up in County Mead. Have you been up there, Karen? No, I've never. Yeah, it's worth going to. Like it's, I, I, would, I would go as far as saying that when you walk inside Newgrange, inside the, 
the passageway. It's akin to some sort of spiritual experience. You're, you're, my heart just like sinks when I go into it. It's this passage tomb that's been 5,000 years old. The area is really interesting. It's in it's called the Bruin of Boyne. It's in the bend of the Boyne, the river. And it was a kind of a an area that was um, very special in Ireland, uh, built by the Neolithic people. And they dragged stones for like 60 kilometers away, a big, huge, massive rocks, like, you know, like five, six meters long or more um, by three or four meters high to, to this area to build this thing. But anyway... There was all this... it's the, the mathematics and the engineering that it lines up perfectly with the the winter and summer solstice precisely. That's, like that's the right, yeah. mathematical and yeah, ast- 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 astrological knowledge. They call it astro archaeology. So lots of it, like yeah. like Karen says, marries up. But then on the twenty first of December at the winter solstice, there's a, a a light box over the passageway, and then actually the light comes in and lights up the whole passageway. Now there was a there was there's a whole folklore going on in in Ireland as there has been for many years about this um, the two and Adana like these fairies or this underworld, but as part of this there was this like big giant called a dog that had lived around this area, and the whole story gets kind of complex about you know um, people having sex with each other that then had offspring but they were related and so on and this went on this story went on for thousands of years in Ireland about two and a half years ago in Ireland some, from some with method of uh, carbon dating or analyzing the bones that were found when excavated in the late 60s, they actually found that the people buried inside that chamber were actually related and it married up with the story that went on for thousands of years. So that really, to me, in our culture in Ireland was just a, a, a you know, and I should get a better um, overview of that story. Um, it is very early in the morning, <laughs> but um, I'll, I'll try and get a link and put it into the show notes. But it was how the, the dog that had slept, I think, with with his daughter or daughter-in-law or something. But anyway, when they did the carbon dating inside the chamber, the people were actually related. Like, that's fascinating, I think, that these stories can be these, you know, arcs into, into the future for us. There's a couple of things that, that strikes me with that, that story. And one is, is that where did they get the technology, first of all, to even construct something so oh, astronomically yeah. precise? And the other is how it reflects onto the unconscious world, the archetypes, the hero archetype, the the warrior archetype, the the child archetype. So what you're talking about is stories passed on generation to generation that are very sound, that have a really uh, physical basis in, in existence. And the corollary, the shadow of that is that there are consistent themes throughout history, like the mother and uh, like the mother and father complex, right? The Oedipus mm-hmm. complex and, and the Electra complex From Freud, that manifest yeah. so well onto the physical world. And, and so I think that's what, what fascinates me about everything in the Bible, because it's closely related to the physical, but also the the metaphysical or the or the energy plane, if you will. So whether we look at neuroscience and brain waves or look at blood flow and different aspects of the brain, the neocortex, which makes us human, or the reptilian brain that drives the primitive urges, what Freud might, might have called the id and the superego and the ego, what Jung may have called the shadow and the persona, yeah. all these consistent themes keep recurring throughout our history. And there's obviously some biological wiring there that results in these recurring themes the sun god, you know, we we speak about the sun god and the pagan rituals mapping on really well with some Christian beliefs as well. We look at the Greek gods and and uh, other myths and how they have an impact in today's society and how we choose to extricate certain things and incorporate other things and expect the, the, the myths and the themes and the archetypes remain consistent. No, they go hand in hand. Now you look at Marvel comics and the hero doesn't have to face any adversity. He's the hero. He doesn't have to face his inner demons as well. But if you look at the ancient hero archetypes, the hero archetypes would consult with the wise ones, with the sages, mm. would have to confront their own mortality, would have to go into the abyss and face the dragon, right? They wouldn't just get the accolades and the crown without all the effort and, the, and near death experiences. So I think we've unfortunately gone far away, moved far away from those ancient recurring themes and, and motifs throughout human history. And I think Carl Jung also spoke about this. The only way to come back in terms of have healing this divide in society is to do inner work, is to look at what's underneath, right? So be still and know. So shut off the external and go internal. 
Yeah, and I think I the, a prime example of that is the difference in the hero movies now versus w- when you look at something who uh, something like the Lord of the Rings with the Frodo journey, and a, as an as an a, a example of the a, a perfect exemplar of the hero archetype, but particular because of the the shadow confrontation that he needed to partake in throughout that story, and the fact that he didn't figure it all out at the end and Gollum ended up taking it off him rather than him giving it up, you know, and it ended up killing Gollum. But so it's like that, just that, 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 that uh, illustration of the, the, the flaws in humanity and that this, this inability to ever access perfection, but that there's a still, it's worth the attempt, you know, and you compare that Frodo journey to, modern hero movies with the it's the best attempt I've, I've seen in of late at a at a hero's journey is actually the reverse the anti-hero's journey which was the actually the 2019 joker movie with joaquin phoenix that and that was actually like the the reverse hero's journey it was the hero's journey where everything went wrong at each step it was the opposite you ended up with a scenario where this is how you make a villain so it's like, uh, yeah, it's 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 a uh, it, that encapsulation of um, or how far we've drifted, and and it's almost like a kind of a, a a fast food version of the hero archetype. That's what we have. It's like we have like a we have like we have a fast food version, of, kind of a plastic a plastic fast food version of the hero archetype. Um, how do you? Oh, go on. Oh, just about the, the with Tolkien. Are, are you familiar much with the with the Lord of the Rings? Yes, I am. Yes, and yeah, and and, and in relation to to Tolkien, just from a, a Catholicism perspective, was, is there anything? Because I've only recently even found out that Tolkien was Catholic, and uh, oh, really? I only actually only learned that only only in the last few months. Even I didn't really know anything about the man himself. Just the uh, the story, obviously. Like millions of other people blew me away, but is was there is there anything about the story or about Tolkien itself? Just just because we're on the hero archetype that jumps out or springs to mind about either the Frodo story or the Christian symbology or mythologies within that Lord of the Rings, or just anything about Tolkien that stands out, just out of curiosity. It's a new discovery for me. Yes, it does actually, because when we think about Genesis, right? The first book in the Bible, we think about self-consciousness coming to human beings. It was a cataclysmic event. It was a big event. It was a big change. And then we, we fall from God's favor and God sends us out to figure it out on our own. Um, we look at Abraham. Abraham, it starts off with his wife being barren. They want to emphasize that because it was a big source of shame, a big problem for them. And then God says, well, what's the first thing you do? You go out, go into the unknown. And that's kind of like the the hero's journey, right? You have to go into the unknown. Moses and the Israelites, again, a recurring theme. You go into the desert. We don't know how long you're going to be there. We don't know whether you're going to face poisonous snakes. Well, yeah, they face poisonous snakes. And they begged God for, for mercy and for help. And God said, well, it could be a lot worse, right? I could also starve you and cause you to, to have burns uh, and whatever. So we're always faced with the challenge of knowing our true potential when we are put out of our comfort zone. If we are not out of our comfort zone, we will never know what we're capable of. When I was 16 years old, I decided not to be Christian anymore. And I said, This sucks. Why should we just deal with suffering? Why is God so unfair? Look at the Old Testament. Sounds like a very scary God. But as you go through the Bible and experiences, one of my uncles at the age of 16, I told him, life isn't fair. This sucks. And he said, who said life was supposed to be fair? (laughs) I didn't know what to say in response to this guy, right? Because that's, that's a fact. Life isn't fair. What is complete balance? Do you really want a flat line? Is that what life is about on the EKG I think about it as a doctor you know you never want a flat line that means you're dead so I guess our role in life is to 
have a general sense of direction. But in order to know that, you have to begin with the end in mind. You have to have a, a purpose and mm. not the ultimate goal, but at least the next step on your journey. But in order to do that, you need to know who you are. You need to know your roots. As the ancient Chinese saying goes, grow like a tree, but never forget your roots. But how often do we really explore who we are? How do we do the inner work? We're only aware of what's within our awareness in terms of who we are and what we portray to the world. So we're afraid to step outside of a comfort zone or face what Carl Jung spoke about in terms of the shadow, what's basically everything under the surface when it comes to the iceberg analogy, what's under the surface that we pushed aside through our lives, right guys? Born into the world as infants, we're kind of whole, we scream, yell, get whatever we want. But as we go through life, we have roles to fulfill as Christians, as sons, as daughters, as wives, as husbands, as, as fathers, as friends, as professionals. And anything that doesn't fit in with that role in that phase of life, we push into the shadow. It's unacceptable. But we're missing out on a huge portion of our core identity. And if we do not face that shadow, whether it's the undesirable ones, which are good learning opportunities, or desirable qualities within the shadow, we will never know who we are. And if we don't know who we are, how can we even start accepting ourselves, let alone step into the abyss or even outside of our homes or the desert, the proverbial yeah. desert, if you will. Sh Shane, for people, um, for people who may not know what the shadow is by, by Carol Young, how would you describe the shadow? How would you like, give a definition of it? The shadow is everything that we choose not to face, both consciously and unconsciously. Everything that is not consistent with our role at that point in time. So right now I wear clothes, right? I could also walk around Chicago nude, but that's not considered appropriate. So anything that's naturally instinctual, we push into the shadow. Now there's an individual shadow I have, and there's a collective human shadow we all have. So Carl Jung said, we're capable of the best and worst. Mm -hmm. I'm capable of being yeah. a murderer, and so are you guys. Put in the right situation, if you have to defend a loved one or protect yourself, kill or be killed. It goes back to the Cain and Abel story in the Bible again that we could elaborate on. So the shadow is everything we push into, into the darkness that we want to avoid in order to function in our roles consciously on the conscious level. But if we do not experience what the shadow is and what it teaches us, then we lose out on huge learning opportunities mm. to merge the shadow and the persona. We need to know what we're capable of, whether it's for bad or good. I wouldn't say bad or good because it's a judgmental term. Let's say learning opportunities, right? Rumi spoke about that in his poem, The Guest House. What learnings can I have from this? Let these experiences come into my living room, have a seat and tell me what they need to teach me. If but we this don't face shadow, we will, it'll go on becoming bigger and bigger. If you think about running during the day and as the longer the day goes, the bigger the shadow gets. You cannot reject the shadow. You cannot pretend it doesn't exist. The yin and the yang. Yeah. As yeah. above or below. Yeah, I, I, as you're talking there, I'm just thinking about, I was saying to Kieran, like during the week, I've been reading a lot of Nietzsche lately. I've been really getting into Nietzsche and I really like him. And it's, um, there's there's a lot of that in Nietzsche, like beyond good and evil, you know, there's like, it's very like, like karma, there's action, there's, there's black, there's white, things flow into each other. You know, it is, like he said in his book, beyond good and evil. And it's a bit like the Carl Jung stuff that you were talking about as well. Um, but I find when you talk, there's lots of nearly Buddhism in your, in your speech in terms of like, you know, um, using suffering as a vehicle as well to for improvement. And I think yes. what's happening, I think what's happening today is like, like I know Kieran, like Kieran's done combat sports. I do combat sports. You know, we lift weights. We do things to push ourselves. Like Kieran was like climbing today, whatever it might be. We do stuff physically and mentally to push ourselves. But do you feel like in today's world that people just don't want any of that? You talked about the variation, like an AK, AK, AKG, which I think is brilliant because I think what people want is they don't want all that variation in life. They want every day to be just perfect. Every day must be beautiful. There should be no adversity. We should all get along. We should all be equal. And it's 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 beautiful in your mind to think about like a blue sky thinking, but in practicality, it's not real. 
and we don't thrive as humans underneath that condition. You're absolutely right there. If we have everything hunky-dory, if there's only love and fresh air, where's the learning? Mm. How will you know what's good if you don't know what's bad? Yeah, yeah. Darkness is the absence of light, right? <laughs> yeah. So I do feel that even in the Bible, the Old Testament, now, many, many years later, 25 years later, looking back and say, asking my parents, why did God do so many horrible things to Job? Like the book of Job. Job was a good man. He was a pious man. He was a faithful man. Satan goes and tells God, well, you think he's that good? Is that is because you've given him everything. You've blessed him with so much. What, let's see what he does when you make him suffer. And well, you know, God made Job suffer terribly, terribly. He he had lost his herds of cattle, his servants, his sons, his daughters. He had boils. He had to scrape away with glass shards while sitting in the ashes of his former home. His wife told him he should curse God. His friends couldn't do anything to help him out. And so I said, why should God be so evil to these people? His chosen people, the Israelites, are suffering for decades and generations in the desert. But then what if God is a shadow? What if God would not be able to exist unless there was evil as well? How can God be present without those that worship him, without us? So God, Job begged God to help him out. And God instead tried to act dismissive, right? He showed his power, his terrible majesty, pretended Job did, lacked the understanding. But Job stood his ground. And what happened? God learned something. So what if humanity suffers so that God's shadow might be known to God himself, whatever you consider God to be, so that gives purpose to our struggle through evil and darkness. It gives us purpose individually because self-esteem, the concept on the side note, was invented by a journalist. I think that's bull crap, okay? Hollow self-esteem, you're so good, you're so good, everyone deserves a cookie, rubbish. Not everyone deserves a cookie, okay? And the research supports that as well, guys. So those students who studied their butts off and got A's and the students that didn't do anything slacked off and got A's as well, the students that got A's that worked hard were miserable because they said we worked so damn hard and now we were the same as everyone else. And those that didn't work hard actually felt guilty. So this whole concept of, Let's avoid suffering. Let's dig our heads in the sand like ostriches. It's the best way to create a further division between your persona, what you portray, mm. and your, your shadow. And that will not enable you to become whole over time, which I feel is our, at the very basic level, our purpose is to try and integrate rather than segregate those components, this black and white thinking which takes away from the nuance and the learning and the struggle and the opportunities that rely, that, that exist within the struggle for each one of us. So it's a beautiful thing when self-esteem is built through self-efficacy, right? The, 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 the excitement to know that with great freedom comes great responsibility, as Victor Frankl spoke about it, or the fact that we are in control of our own destiny to some degree and that we, in fact, can <clears throat> can be co-creators with God. Otherwise, what's the purpose of prayer? Uh, uh, the black and white thing, just as a funny you mentioned that, because as you were speaking, um, I was thinking, you, that, I never heard that before. What if God has a shadow? I like that. And uh, mm -hmm. I actually have a book there, a Carl Jung book about the book of Job. Um, a, Car Car a small Carl Jung book about the book of Job, and I haven't read it yet. Um, I'm looking forward. I'm actually, I might pick that up next after I finish this next, this next one. But, um, but, and I think about that, about you mentioned there, the, the, the black and white thinking, the fascinating thing with that is if you follow that all the way to the bottom, it's the yin and yang interdependency of opposites. So it's actually like when, when you, when you fought with the fascinating thing about the interdependency of opposites is that let's say you have, uh, let's say you have union and division. But the fascinating thing about both of those is they have a relation. So the relation of union precedes union and division. So if you have a, a prime mover 
for existence. Like whether you want to call it God or nature, like Spinoza, like Deus Siva Natura, it was Spinoza's thing, God or nature or substance, or you have an Aristotelian prime mover or whatever we you want to call it. William Blake, in he had this beautiful, uh, really psychedelic poem, The Marriage of Heaven and Hell. And in it, he has one particular line that's awesome. He says, without contraries is no progression. And Heraclitus had a very similar sentiment, which is that there needs to be, in, uh, on a, a lawyer, for, there needs to be tension. There's tension between ends of a bow that the string is holding. Mm -hmm. And that's what allows an arrow to shoot. It has to be the tension between opposites to facilitate progression. And it's that that's like the yin and yang, the union of opposites precedes the opposites. The tension between the ends of a bow is needed to shoot the arrow. Like it's, it's when you view it like that, it becomes like the, the good or evil couldn't exist without each other. But the relationship of them both precedes both. So it's like um, when, when you, what you were saying earlier on uh, about uh, uh, roots, it's one of my favorite lines when you mentioned the tree, where it was um, Nietzsche, who uh, I know Ian, he's read a lot of Nietzsche, but Nietzsche had a massive influence on Carl Jung, massive influence on him. And like the Red Book is almost like Carl Jung's attempt at the Spoke Zarathustra or something, this yeah. psychedelic, metaphorical, um, dreamlike, uh, uh, bizarre uh, text that's foot rich in symbology, but um in in, in uh, it was young young had this line that he took from nietzsche but nietzsche's version of it was something along the lines of uh um uh, that basically that the, the branches can only reach to heaven if the roots are reaching towards hell that the branches have to, are only able to reach towards heaven if the if the roots are reaching towards hell down into the dark into evil so like that's like there has to be that 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 interdependency of opposites that you have to have that balance in each direction as an example of how shadow integration needs to work that you can only be and this is a jordan peterson sentiment as well that i really like which is that a good person isn't a weak person like a weak person isn't good because they don't do harm a, a, a beastly person who chooses not to do harm is good because they're capable of it but someone who's not capable of harm who doesn't do harm isn't necessarily good. They're just incapable of doing harm. And that's that integration of shadow. That's what mm -hmm. makes a, that's that, that acceptance that, uh, that's, that's the facilitator of growth, of expansion. You know, the, the shadow as that, as that wellspring of potential. Two, two things on that, Karen, just before Shane responds, is just to back up what you're saying about Peterson, because he's got these like quotes as well that he said at that, that gone up on Instagram or YouTube. And exactly to what you said, he said, if you think that, you know, this, this group is, is evil or bad, be careful and what, what weak people can do, what weak men can do, which is so interesting. And the other thing is, I think it was in Dublin when him and Sam Harris sat down, facilitated by, it was Douglas Murray or somebody else. But anyway, when we were asked to describe evil, Sam Harris gave an answer that was kind of, you know, oh, this is evil and this and groups and whatever. And Jordan Peterson sat there and said he knew what evil was when he knew what he was capable of doing. Mm. And that's like, that's more powerful than any sort of academic answer. It's like, to your point, Shane, when you can look inside and you know that you have the ability to basically rip someone's fucking head off and kill them. Like, if you think about a loved one and you think if someone touched them, what you would do. Like, I remember somebody shouted at my great nephew one day and I went down to this guy and I was like, I'm going to kill him. I'm just going to kill him. And it was a complete, it was a, a complete inappropriate response. But I was like, I could feel like I could actually kill this guy right now. Cause he's even looked at this, my, my nephew. That's what I felt like. And I was like, wow, that was a crazy. And even my wife got irate. And it was just really interesting to watch us kind of turn into these beasts nearly. And I was like, wow, I've been going like that a long time. But it was like you were nearly possessed. And it's like, you are capable of doing that. So when people think, I'm a good person, I can't do this. No, you are. I think people are capable of killing somebody or ripping someone's head off. And it's interesting to look at that in yourself because you know you could do it in that frenzy. Yeah. Uh, oh, I, this is so brilliant, Kieran, what, what you just said and, and Ian as well, because it goes back to what a psychoanalyst professor once told me 10 years ago. 
he said, whenever we're dealing with patients, Shane, keep this in mind, you need to quickly determine their range of function. He gave me the analogy of water, H2O. On one end, it can be ice, in the middle, water, and on the other end, water vapor. So yeah. if you know someone's range of function and you can predict to some degree of certainty, dangerousness and safety, but in our own lives, where it goes back to us not wanting to face that which is difficult. I believe that difficulties can reveal who we are at any given point in time. They don't necessarily change us. And difficulties can mean actual emotional stress. It can mean external environmental factors. It can mean substance use as well. So those things will reveal who you are at any given point in time, allow the shadow to unfold before your very eyes and before the eyes of people around you. And rather than avoid it, ask ourselves what this can teach us. So it goes back to the Bible. It starts off with us being whole, we're cast onto earth and we're supposed to figure all this out by ourselves. And throughout the Bible, it's a journey of trying to rediscover who we are at our core. So I think the Bible is an attempt by humanity to solve some of the deepest problems that we have. And the problems primarily being of self-consciousness. We're mortal. We know it. We have a limited life. We know that life is full of struggle. But people say, well, the Buddha, when he reached enlightenment, he said all of human existence is dukkha, suffering. Hmm. But... He never said it was a bad thing, right? We're assuming <laughs> yeah. that that's a bad thing. Yeah, we applied a value judgment to that yeah, as yeah. if that's we are saying. That, yeah. It's such a good thing. It's a value judgment that that enables us to go into this black and white thinking. As a neuroscientist, I could say that we have the emotional brain that's irrational, emotional, and then we have the cognitive brain that's rational. So the emotional circuits deep inside the brain, the basal ganglia, the deep limbic system map onto emotional, irrational thinking, catastrophic thinking, guilt, negativity, shame, self-doubt, low self-esteem. Whereas the rational brain has joy, connectedness, humanity, higher purpose and drive. So even at the neurobiological level, we think about these competing things and this tension that needs to exist in order for our very existence to continue, but also the learnings that, that are ongoing. And so the more I've dived into this stuff, what you might call spirituality or quantum physics or, or metaphysics or religion, these consistencies go way, way deeper than, than we think. And the only problem, the, the problem with why the whole war with religion and science came about was Back in 1896, with this president of Cornell University, Andrew Dixon White, who published a book um, called A History of the Warfare of Science with Theology in Christendom. And under his influence, the metaphor of this warfare to describe relations between science and the Christian faith became widespread during the first half of the 20th century. Um, this whole history of warfare is a myth. There are books to, to show this, uh, The Soul of Science uh, by Thaxton and Piercy. Up until the 19th century, scientists were typically Christian believers, right? And now if, you, mm. if a scientist is Christian, they say, really? You believe yeah, in yeah, God? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right? It's no. I mean, we have to understand the context of the Bible, the metaphors and the parables, and look at how it influences our world today. So it's like science and religion to me are like two circles which intersect or partially overlap and it's the area of intersection that dialogue should take place. And there's some societies now that, that actually promote dialogue, some medical journals as well that promote the dialogue between theology and science. And I hope that continues because that's what's really needed. If we only allow our emotional brains to dictate, we go into black and white thinking, the whole cancel culture concept rather than allowing open dialogue. Yeah. And it goes back to the Bible. The seven deadly sins are basically exactly what the emotional brain does. And the 10 commandments are simply examples of things you would do if you're performing at a higher level of human consciousness. It's not like, it's like, if you don't do this, you'll burn in hell. No, if you do this, 
you're in a higher state. These are examples of what someone in a higher state would do. And these examples of someone in a lower state would do. The same goes to Native American culture here with the two wolves analogy with the, a little boy asking the Cherokee elder, um, a fight is going on inside me. It's a terrible fight between these two wolves. One wolf is evil. He's anger, envy, sorrow, regret, greed, arrogance, self-pity, guilt, resentment, inferiority, false pride, ego. And the other is good. Joy, peace, love, both benevolence, hope, serenity, humility, kindness, generosity. And the boy asks, well, which wolf will win? And the elder simply replies, the one that you feed. So isn't it similar to, <laughs> yeah, to yeah. the Ten Commandments and going back to the seven deadly sins, it maps onto neurobiology, it maps onto whatever culture you look at. So when I was doing all these readings throughout my life, I was finding these parallels consistent across centuries, millennia, groups of people, tribes, different religions, different languages. It's pretty crazy. So... So Shane, you you articulated earlier on about you know being raised a Catholic and then sort of you know giving it up, which I think a lot of teenage boys would do. Um, you know, I certainly did. But then you went down this very rational scientific path. You became a physical therapist. You became a doctor. You've then you've widespread. You've read and you've gone down the more psychiatric route, which I think is interesting, as opposed to being a surgeon or a, a plastic surgeon or something like that, where you could make you know loads of money and be very much down that kind of atheistic, um, we'll say, uh, glamour, rich, money, um, what would you say, like, um, what's the word I'm looking for? More this um, materialistic path. Hedonistic, materialistic. Hedonistic, yeah. Hedonistic and materialistic. But you went the opposite way. Why did you come back to Catholicism? Why not pick something else like Buddhism that was more like, we'll say, New Age or, you know, more, you know, you know kind of cool in the West or you know, go to San Francisco and join some Zen group or why didn't you uh, maybe ch choose a different form of Christianity? Why go back to Catholicism? Wow. Um, many reasons. One of the primary ones is that understandably, there were many books written, the Bible was put together over centuries by different people. But I do believe there were good, good faith attempts and accurately transcribing from word of mouth, as you gave the example at the beginning, this ancient structure, now you find that there was some incest involved in, through carbon dating of the bones. So when you go back, the, the consistent themes in the Bible also have very tangible solutions if you pay attention. So unlike, let's just be and see what happens and accept everything. Well, what is our role as co-creators? What can we do to change or improve our faith in those uh, and, and, the, and the future of those around us? What can we teach to our next generation? The Bible is so powerful to me because it has those higher level things you can dig deeper into. If you truly choose to dig deeper, as we talked about examples with, I could go into, the, the serpent and why the apple was red. Red is the, the most distinctive color to human beings. The mo the cars that are pulled over the most by police across the world are red cars. So it really? draws it. Same, re yep. Same reason ladies put lipstick on, right? It's because it draws your attention to, 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 to them. Red is an attention grabber. We Our blood is red. You look out for danger. So the Bible is at these powerful themes that are not intangibles. They are intangible, but can be made tangible. Like the subconscious mind made conscious. We bring it to our own awareness. And so the other thing is that the Bible also has the, the sacred feminine, the Virgin Mary. And Carl Jung spoke about the anima and animus. Anima is the female drive, the intrinsic strengths and their intrinsic shadows as well. So here with the anima, it's the archetypal image of the feminine. And this figure tends to be opposite to the individual ego and persona. So it's projected outwards onto the person who we fall in love with, maybe love at first sight, infatuation. And it's basically what we fall in love with, people say opposites attract is only the other aspect of our existence, maybe part of the shadow that we haven't faced, 
but we know we're missing innately because there's some drive innately that drives us toward being more and knowing more and seeking cohesiveness. And so the, the sacred feminine is that which heals, is that what brings us together, mm. is that which nurtures us. The mother, as the saying goes, a woman does not give birth to a child, a child gives birth to a mother. So it represents tremendous tension, tremendous suffering throughout the Bible, but also great potential growth and wholeness and the ultimate salvation, eternal life. And you find you find all sacred the... feminine. Sorry, Karen, go ahead. Just, just that the sacred feminine aspect is something I found so interesting and uh, about the, the Bible that gets obviously it's kind of it's a part of christianity that's dramatically uh underplayed uh, catholicism in particular it's really underplayed in the in in, in normal culture the main part of that is because the, there are nuns of course but it's the priests that run the parishes it's the bishops that run the diocese it's the pope that runs the church you know it's just the male hierarchy but of course nuns are involved but even in the bible even a, even before mary there's, there's um, some, something I've got really interested in, actually from Catholic philosophers and theologians, is uh, Sophia and this notion that, that there's God is at the, in the early in the in book of Genesis, God is talking to someone because he he's, God is using the word we. And yeah. there's, there's, a kind of a, there's this notion of Sophiology, that there's Sophia, the, the mother of wisdom. And mm -hmm. Sophia even appears in books like uh, Boethius, you know, the, um, the, the, the Consolations of Philosophy. Sophia is who appears to Boethius when he's in his prison cell in, in that book, in that, uh, that book, that, like five or 600 AD is that Boethius is, is in prison in real life. He, he was in prison and he wrote this, this text, but uh, the sacred, this, 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 this emphasis on the sacred feminine. And this is actually something though that it, it might be a, a, a slight uh, tangent, but it's in it's in kind of relation to that which is something that i've had a uh, great difficulty with reconciling as it relates to catholicism which is reconciling the epic fallibilities of the church with the uh, again it's all obviously the shadow there's good and bad to everything or there's there's bright there's light and dark to everything but trying to reconcile the epic fallibilities and flaws and errors, and you can, they're myriad lists to be boring even to list them because they're so cliche, but with the ideal that was set by this, that, that unbelievably radical example set by Jesus. And that, 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 that tension is, is so hard to wrap your head around. And how would you, if I if I phrased it well, or if I put it out there, how would how do you think about that? Particularly as it relates to Catholicism, that you have this huge bureaucratic structure uh, that has that has myriad examples of abuses, horrors, barbarisms, crusades, abuse scandals, all these things. But then. How, with, but with then what that's suppo supposed to be based on is this unbelievably radical example of this anti-authoritarian uh, rebel character in Jesus who was like, yeah. <laughs> love everyone, love your, even your enemy, and I'm going to carry him, I'm going to pick up my cross and I'm going to walk towards my death even for my enemy. So like, how, 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 do you, how, how do you think about that, particularly as a Catholic? First up, I know that the Catholic Church has been, you know, guilty of a lot of different things. And, and what's horrible is, is how human beings have manipulated something so well-intentioned for their own purposes throughout history. And I'm sure you guys could speak to the, th the things that have been discovered in Ireland and the Catholic Church, oh, things yeah. that have happened with the child abuse over here. Uh, yeah. The kids were buried in orphanages. We can speak with, to all of those things 
knowing that those are human fallibilities, I doubt Jesus had any of those things in mind when, when he wanted to <laughs> preach the word of God. And so it goes back to one of the founding fathers of the U.S., Thomas Jefferson. He had a beautiful quote. He said, the purest system of morals ever before preached to man by Jesus Christ has been adulterated and sophisticated to filch wealth and power. They raise the UN cry of infidelity while themselves are the greatest obstacles to the advancement of the real doctrines of Jesus and do in fact constitute the real antichrist. So did Jesus say that women should not be priests? I don't recall reading that anywhere. So there are certain things I do not agree with when mm. it comes to the Catholic Church. But in terms of the validity, the impact, the learnings that we can take from the Bible, I think that's where free will comes in. It's our duty not to blindly listen to anybody. Otherwise, why would we have a critical thinking brain that uh, agreed not many people in our generation and time use effectively but why would we have all of this capability but not seek more your cocoon can be your prison although it's your place of safety so to be a prisoner is to be ignorant if ignorance is bliss then why do we seek knowledge so the continual search for wisdom knowledge growth is what fuels basic self-efficacy and purpose. And so with all the fallibilities of the Catholic Church throughout history, while I'm not condoning anything, I think it's important for us to look at ourselves first rather than dismiss the entire religion and interpret it incorrectly. So there's historical context, there's social context, there's cultural context, there's religious context, and there's personal context. Really yeah, I, as you were talking there, Shane, and I don't know why it popped into my head and it's probably a bit crazy, but I thought, okay, so if the Catholic Church is based upon the teachings of Jesus and all these bad things happen, and like you said, Kieran and I would have lots of examples from from Ireland, you know, from, you know, the list is endless. Magdalene and Laundries and all Magdalene and Laundries, you know, there was an orphanage near my hometown where kids were buried and, and so on, and, and there's all the sexual abuse stuff and child abuse and physical abuse and all these things. Do you think in some ways, like maybe talking about a shadow and a demon and a Satan and a Lucifer, or whatever you want to call it, do you think sometimes when something is really um when something is really good in the world, that like the dark attacks it? And this is how it permeates in the claws of the good. So what I'm thinking about is like, are these priests or these people who are doing these, you know, heinous acts and and within the Catholic Church? Are they being, uh, have they been grabbed by the shadow? Have they been grabbed by the devil? Have they been, you know, for want of a better thing, where they're actually in there infiltrating and they don't even know that they're being the, the servants of evil, so to speak, to do it? Because I see it in, in the general, in the world day to day. You see it when someone's trying to do something good in a workplace or in the community, people then come and snipe at them and drag them down and pull them down. And, you know, the tall poppy syndrome, you know, just get dragged down and people are like, who do he think, who does he think he is? And, I remember him 20 years ago when he was this. And now he thinks he's that. And no matter what you do, like, you know, people want to drag you down when you do some do some good. Hence the saying, you know, no good good deed goes unpunished, which I think Tony Soprano said in The Sopranos. And it's such a good saying. But then, like we said earlier on, it's like with Jesus, you know. Um, I think I was saying this to Karen before the podcast. My, I interviewed my auntie, who's been a Catholic nun for nearly 70 years. And she said, in a life of service and a life where you live for other people, comes at great personal cost. And I think it's a great saying. And, and no one has demonstrated that more than Jesus. He went out and he tried to do, you know, as Nietzsche said, he tried to step outside the herd and he tried to influence the herd for the betterment of the herd. And what happens? He literally got nailed to the cross for it. Like, it's it's fascinating when you, when you start thinking about it in these different ways. And like we said earlier on, and Karen said, there is no good and bad and there is no, it's things happening. So what do you think about that kind of, thought that's popped into my head about this evil permeating good and trying to drag it down absolutely you've seen that happen throughout the bible again i keep going back to that because we can have these parallels in our day-to-day -day lives we look at politicians who are philandering uh we look at 
why they're choosing to enact bad policies that make lots of people suffer. We look at Satan tempting Jesus in the desert while Jesus mm -hmm. meditated 40 days, right? So inherently, the higher you go, the more likely you are to fall. But if you never venture forth, you're already fallen. My grandfather used to tell us, aim for the moon and maybe you'll, you'll reach the, the treetops, right? So you need to have that direction, but also that innate purpose. And so it goes back to, to hoping that, I would say hope rather than expectation, because expectation basically means you're trying to control the outcome, but hoping for the best and the best not necessarily meaning no pain and suffering, but yes, Jesus was ideal, the ideal, the embodiment of goodness and kindness while also challenging the status quo. And then what happened? His own people betrayed him. And how did he go? He went the worst possible suffering you could think of, right? You stop breathing, acid builds up as your diaphragm can't really. So you're basically suffocating and bleeding out and developing and toxins are building up in your system. It's, it's the most horrific way to die. That's why the, the Romans designed it that way. So when you are condemned to death, the most horrific death with leading uh, one of the most noble lives you could, what does it say about our lives? What does it say about our suffering? What does it say about our trajectory? If Jesus was the son of God is the son of God. And he said, we're also his brothers and sisters. And then the Bible says we're made in God's image and likeness. Well, what does that mean? Does it mean we look like God? Does that mean we have a sense of direction within us innately that we're not tapping into, but we could if we really dig deeper. And then of course, it doesn't end with Jesus' crucifixion. It ends with his resurrection. So there's redemption to be had. And the cool thing about the hero archetype is that the hero goes into the abyss, into the unknown, faces the dragon, yeah, yeah. and wins. So by mere fact of facing your fears and your dragons, what I tell my patients is dip your toes in the water of uncertainty and hold them there and have the attitude of a toddler, an adventurous toddler, right? And they're like, what do you mean a toddler? Well, toddlers pretty badass, right? They they can't run. They, they try and run. They crawl all over the place. They explore. They try and put their fingers inside sockets. I don't recommend anyone do that. <laughs> but toddlers are badass. Let's be honest. So where did we lose that, guys? Where did we lose the ability to push ourselves, get out of our comfort zones rather than expect everything on a platter, which is a surefire way to, to death, at the very least, the death of your soul. Karen, I don't know what you're thinking, but as Shane talks and the more Shane talks, the more I think Shane is a Stoic more than a Catholic. <laughs> but, yeah, but, yeah. but there's a lot, but there's a lot, but there is a lot of Stoicism in Catholicism. A lot of Stoicism yeah. was brought into Catholicism by the early church fathers. And there was a lot of, cause, cause, but there's a, there's a, um, there, even something that sprung to mind or, that that I think is is really worth pointing out. Like when you mentioned about the crucifixion and the Romans, is that there's a book I only finished uh, a couple of month, a month or two ago called uh, um, it's opening actually up there, Dominion by Tom Holland, and it's about the role of Christianity in shaping the Western world. And it's absolutely astounding, but it opens, I believe, with uh, crucifixion descriptions, and it closes with the same as well. But it's actually a modern crucifixion by ISIS of Yazidi people and it's Tom Holland went to make a documentary with Channel 4 and ended up coming across people who had been crucified by Yazid by by ISIS but a really interesting component that he touches on that it gets lost on us is that the, the value judgments that we have at the moment of this the, the clerical sex abuse scandals and so much of the abuse of women that took place by human beings within the catholic church and even entire groups of human beings who were like it's like the particular form of catholicism that took place in ireland was something that at the same time was very different to the catholicism that was taking place around the rest of europe mm. it was just that there was it was it wasn't it wasn't just catholicism it was a particularly narrow blinkered 
Irish version of it that had really dark elements that we had probably brought through from uh, or being oppressed for so long with the, the British stuff and then the, the famine and all these things went down and then the, the in all loads of stuff went on that made it wasn't just Catholicism. It was, it was, it was an Irish version of it. And what uh, something that was re that's interesting to think about though, is that our value judgments and, and moral judgments more than value judgments of <clears throat> child sex abuse or the treatment of women, like here in Ireland, their Christian moral judgments. Like the idea to a Roman, like, and Tom Holland writes about this, the idea to a Roman male that it's not okay to just rape whoever you want if they're a lower status than you. You can just rape your slaves. Male, female, young, old, it doesn't matter. If they're a slave, you just rape them if you want. Like, you just, that's what, that's what was normal. Like, there was nothing... It was like it, it, it was there was it was all about it was just a, an, a way of imposing power that was just totally acceptable, no matter who you, you it was just a way of demonstrating your power, and that was just a normal part of the Roman world. And the, the, the idea that it wasn't okay to just rape whoever you wanted if you were more powerful than them mm. that's a Christian value, it's a Christian moral structure, you know. and so we're we're judging the Catholic Church now using a Christian lens that we wouldn't have without the Catholic Church. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know, and that's yeah. a that's a like even when 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 Christianity came to Ireland, it was it was Christians that ended up like there was still slaves here and there was still slaves here even after Christianity had had come. But Christianity was what abolished slavery. It was like Protestant Quakers in England in the early eighteen hundreds convincing the British government to stop it. And then the British government ended up going off then and stopping banning slavery and then sending the Navy out to, to stop slave ships. Mm -hmm. But that was a, that was a Christian thing to do. And the, the England then ended up even then going on to in the 1960s, convincing the Saudis to stop official slavery. They're probably still doing it, but they convinced the Saudis to stop officially doing it. It was like 1962, the British government convinced the Saudis to stop slavery. You know, even in Saudi Arabia and in Arabic, the word abid, A-B-I-D, is the word for black person is the same word as for slave. Still. So it's like, it's, it's actually, a, this is something that it's so bizarre to even view, but it's like reading, obviously, Nietzsche. And he had a, he had a Nietzsche's critique in the, in the genealogy of morals was a very, I, I, talk, I mentioned, I was talking about this to Ian the other day, but I think Nietzsche has this, his description of slave morality and his criticisms of Christianity is he's attacking a, sh a, a shadow version of Christian morality, not the bright side of it. And then he has this bigging up of aristocratic morality, but then he's also, but he's choosing not to look at the shadow side of aristocratic morality. Hmm. So he's taking the bright side of aristocratic, ubermensch, get after it, will to power. And he's taking the dark side of the fact that suffering can actually bring you closest to what is highest. Like what's the life raft that's going to keep you around. And he's not looking at the bright side of both. He's not comparing apples and apples. He's comparing a, an apple with a rotted apple, you know? And, in, and that's what he's doing in the genealogy of morals. And, and it's, it's upon reading that and then the likes of dominion and other, the formulations of the changes in moral structures throughout the last 20 centuries or so <laughs> since Jesus was rocking around and seeing how we're swimming in Christian water without realizing it. That's brilliant, Kieran. I yeah. mean, I, I, I dabbled in a bit of existentialism and nihilism 20 years ago, and then I didn't feel it was doing anything for me in terms of giving me a sense of direction, right? It was a great exercise in, in understanding and knowledge and deep thinking, but I didn't feel it was doing anything to make me have sense of direction and hope and purpose and, and tangible stuff. And so I kind of moved away from that, but I, I think it's a, it would be a great idea to revisit that with the additional information I have at this point in life and kind of look at those parallels because you're right. I think there's two different things that are being compared there. And then those conclusions would be biased conclusions, wouldn't they? Yeah, something that yeah. this and this relate. You mentioned the cancel culture, and this is something that I find so fascinating. Having read the genealogy of morals, uh, one he one of the things that Nietzsche makes a big point of, and that is this notion of resentment. It's like French. I don't know. There's a particular type of resentment, but 
I think if you, I, I think of it in terms of Mark 2016 in the Bible, where it's the notion of the last will be first and the first last. But there's two different ways of viewing that, I think, for that I can that I can think of as two ways that spring to mind. One of them relates to cancel culture. So and and the kind of like this viewing of human relations through a lens of identity characteristics, where it's like it's almost like so. If you think about it from the first to be last and the last first, how I think of it is the the more in the shit you are, the more likely and, and you 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 you're gonna need something. The more in the shit you are, the darker into the abyss you are, the deeper into the abyss you are, the more bright a light needs to be in order for you to still be able to see it when you turn back and look at your life. So like when you're deeper and darker into the abyss, when you turn around and look at your life, the brighter something still needs to be for you to still be able to see it. Whereas if things are just rocking and smooth and everything is kind of comfortable, everything is kind of the same brightness. And you don't really realize what's actually sustaining for you. What is actually a sustaining force, a sustaining orientation until you're in the shit. And you mentioned Viktor Frankl earlier on. Like that's an example. You're in a concentration camp, you're in a gulag or... Alexander Solzhenitsyn in That's the gulag. Shit. Yeah, yeah, you're in, you're in the shit. You, you really need something special to keep as a flotation device, and that's how I think of the positive interpretation of Mark 2016 is the close, the the the, the deeper and darker in the abyss you are, the the more likely you are to be, if you're able to get through it. You're maybe it's because you've been able to orientate toward what is highest, what is still brightest in the deepest worst possible situation but the other side of it is the dark the shadow interpretation of that i think relates to using being an aspiring victim in order to climb social status or social hierarchy through aspiring victimhood which is this idea that i'm special and i'm better than you because i'm a victim or i'm more of a victim than you are that's the shadow. First will be last and the last first. That's like this bizarre aspiring victimhood we see where people are almost trying to accumulate identity characteristics of oppressed or formerly oppressed or currently oppressed groups. Like the more, what do they call it? Intersectionality. The more intersecting nodes I can accumulate of oppressed yeah. identity characteristics <clears throat> I, I paradoxically get flipped upside down as the most important person in the group or a society. And that's, again, the last of you first and the first last, but like the shadow view of it. It's got to do with relationships of inferiority or superiority. And it's the same thing with the other side, like Nietzsche would talk about this aristocratic morality, where the bright side of that is this idea of like, everyone else can do what they want i think there's, there's, a, there's an old parable that there's two ways of building your of, of having the tallest tower in town one is to knock other people's towers down the other one is to just keep building your own and fuck it whatever comes what may but i think the aristocratic morality this kind of like will to power ubermensch the bright side of that is what you do what you're going to do i'm what i'm going to do i'm going to fucking get after it will to power fuck it let's go and you just put the head down and off we go the dark side of that is I'm better than you because I have more than you or I've accomplished more than you or I've ac accomplished certain extrinsic things or I've met certain societal markers. Therefore, I'm superior to you. So it's like the shadow side to both elements of slave morality or aristocratic morality in a Nietzschean sense relate to this. The, the shadow side to both is this relating yourself to someone else as if you have a greater intrinsic worth than them mm -hmm. because of something that's going on. And it's like, but and maybe that's just, again, I could talk about this Christian values, but, but even at any level, even if I just, obviously I'm looking at it now from being raised in a Christian, in Christian water here in Ireland, but there's a, at the end of the day, there's just like, we are all, like, none of us chose where we were born. None of us chose our parents. None of us chose our circumstances. We are all, to use like existentialist language, thrown into existence at times and places we didn't choose. And we're all these unfolding, ever-changing expressions of reality that are, uh, that like, none of us chose these circumstances. So like, there, there is something like to even, to this notion of radical equality, at a, in, not in not in terms of 
flattening hierarchies of competence or denigrating achievement, but just in terms of like radical equality, like in a Christian sense, it'd be the eyes of God, but just radical equality relative to nature. If you, if someone wanted to use a non religiously loaded term, it's like, it makes sense at, at every level, whether we view it from a Christian moral lens or even at just a description of reality in a scientific sense, it's still as radical equality in an intrinsic level. Again, I'm not trying to look at it from a perspective of flattening hierarchies and say that everyone, everyone gets a fucking participation medal. I'm not trying to say that by any means, you know, but sorry, that was just like a, a, a stream of consciousness there based on everything we talked about. So here, I can't remember how we started. <laughs> oh, crucifixion, crucifixion. There we go. Sorry. Amazing. This is so valuable to me. And, and I, it just makes me think about, yes, to everything you said, the first and the last, last and the first, I completely agree. And, and now it goes back to the cancel culture debate, right? Mm. It makes sense now, the way you beautifully articulated it, that in order for their victimhood to gain attention, they have to virtue signal, so they choose the intangibles, external intangibles, rather than the tangibles they can work on. Mm -hmm. They need to cancel out facts, because facts fly in the face of, of their faulty reasoning. So that's mm -hmm. when you have cancel culture. And that's when you seek external validation from those who tend to fuel your victimhood delusion. So people talk about white privilege in this country. There's no such thing as white privilege. I do believe in white guilt, but not white privilege. If you look at the numbers, if you look at how many people immigrated here and started from nothing, how many people, when you look at the, the wages across demographics, right? Asians top the list. Uh, the average middle-class African-American woman earns more than the average middle-class Caucasian woman, I could go on and on about these examples, but people don't want to listen to the facts because then their whole victimhood claim falls apart. So we have a situation where they're choosing the external validation because they're not really doing any inner work. They're not choosing to ch say that these are things within my control to improve my lot in life. And so it, Colin spoke about this, in larger groups, psyche devolves to the lowest common denominator, mm -hmm. right? So it's simplistic, all good, all bad, cancel, you agree with this politician because of these things, but he did this one thing one time, great, that means you're evil and you're a racist and you're a xenophobe and all these things. So it's persona driven, it's not integration driven. And mm -hmm. if you avoid your shadow, then you're going to, your primal drives will predominate. That's when you virtue signal. That's when your ego identifies with the persona. That's when you want to save face. And so cancel culture because it triggers the primal fears that you're now projecting onto this group think kind of image. And so it's just that either you're, you're being played by the system, where I feel sorry for you, or you are perpetuating this. And I feel sorry for any, anyone else who surrounds you, right? So under the grip of the collective shadow, it smothers your growth. It rejects independent thinking. It's selfish. It's, in my opinion, the, the ultimate narcissism. And you, on, that, on that note, yeah. could, you speak, could you speak to shadow projection? Because this is something we've talked about, the shadow a lot. But <clears> I think <throat> one of the most, and this is, this, is a, this is a Jungian concept. I'm very biased because I found this unbelievably beneficial in my own life which is uh, uh this kind of note of sh this concept of shadow projection and recognizing in a very if i was in a very simplistic sense that what i most what i'm what i most viscerally dislike about someone else is quite possibly what i'm most afraid of within myself so like would, would you would you speak to that because i think this is one of the most important components of Jungian psychology and it's one of the most mm. it's so relevant today where there's so much vitriol and hatred and really visceral conflict that's very it's 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 not, it's as you said it's it's not on, it's not based on facts it's not based on r rational argumentation or a capacity to there's like a ma massive asymmetry between epistemic justification and phenomenal certainty where there's this big fucking crevice 
where people cannot rationally justify their situation or their, their, their viewpoint, but they have a state of phenomenological absolutism at the same time. That's, that's so, and as a res, and then they just wash it away with, oh, this is just my lived experience. I'm right and you're wrong because, because, and then there's, there's just, it's just so empty, but it's so visceral and hard and, and it fuels so much extra conflict just begets more conflict mm. so like sorry I'm, I, but shadow projection as a psychiatrist someone who's really up on young i think it's i'd love to hear what what your take on it is and 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 how you see it even playing out in culture especially being in america and the hotbed of all these culture wars and everything yeah we see that in well on the individual level if you don't like something innately whether you're aware of it or not you're going to project a great love for it so if if you if you're afraid of going into a very dangerous area like i live in chicago let's say the south side side chicago is very dangerous lots of gun violence there you'll avoid it and since the population in that dangerous area is predominantly African-American, you might assume that all African-Americans are criminals. So you might cross the, the sidewalk and go to the other side if you see someone coming along the same sidewalk late at night. Does that mean you're racist? Or does that mean that a lot of the crimes in the area are committed by people of that descent, that ethnicity? So you want to be cautious. It doesn't mean, mean you're racist. It means that you're acting out a projection that, that you feel um, you know, is validated. Another example would be what we call transference in psychiatry. When I'm dealing with certain patients uh, and I'm doing therapy, there are certain uh, patients who might not like something I said or the way I said it. And they would be like, well, why did you be so dismissive? So one example, I could ask somebody, well, do you smoke weed? Which might be considered condescending or or not accepting, or I could ask, well, how much weed do you smoke? Same question, but completely different context, right? So if I ask how much weed do you smoke, they assume I'm, I've assumed that they smoke weed. And one person may be like, yeah, I smoke two grams a day. Another person may say, how dare you assume I smoke weed? Hmm. So where did that reaction come from? It's a, it's a transference, a manifestation of shadow, perhaps, Growing up, they were a very strict family. The parents would frown upon it. They were strictly punished. And so their anger, in a way, there's a really good book, uh, The Children of Emotionally Immature Parents, which is a fascinating read. It, it describes how your reactions, your communication patterns when you are emotional, when something strikes a nerve, when people take things personally, it comes up in an overreaction because our earliest memories ever neurobiologically are our emotional memories. Our emotional brain develops first, our rational brain, our frontal lobes finish developing in our late 20s, early 30s. So the earliest memory anyone will have is an emotional memory. Emotional memories are not always pleasant, but they will be reactivated, reignited with any clue or cue now at this point in our lives and that's what happens in recurring patterns toxic relationships um emotional outbursts you can talk about that on the individual level so that's how the shadow manifests externally individually we can also think about the shadow in terms of when the vaccines for covid came out right big controversial topic it's i didn't want to get it originally because i wanted more data to be available but I could have easily been dismissed as anti-vax. Am I anti-vax or am I pro-data that's not funded by biased organizations, right? Big difference there. But I predicted to a few friends in 2021, in February, I said, if there is a vaccine that comes out, this is what's going to happen. They're going to force everyone to take it. They're going to convince everyone to take it, first of all. If people are not, if everyone isn't getting it, then they're going to say, well, you can't associate, you can't assimilate, you cannot come out of lockdown and hiding. So they're going to be punishing you. They're going to be removing you from the herd. Think the tribe, think the belongingness, right? That's a big factor there. So they're going to attack you at your, at your subconscious level. Then they're going to say, well, okay, you're still not getting the vaccine. Your friends and family, 
you want their loved ones to be murdered with this virus? Do you want your own friends and family and your elderly relatives to be dead? You're going to be responsible, right? Then the guilt, then the are facing on mortality. It goes back to, to deep psychological concepts. And mm-hmm. so the way that whole thing progressed, even if you had been infected and a great article out of nature showed that you're more you have more robust immunity against all the variants with natural infection than you would through the vaccine. And now we're looking at more data and death rates. I'll keep that whole topic aside. Don't worry. Mm. I'm giving you a small example, not to dismiss the vaccine. I mean, I got it as well because I needed to travel to Europe to give a, a talk at the Nadal Academy. But it was really important for me to look at this whole group thing, this herd mentality, and look at how easily we're getting drawn in by this tribalistic mm. kind of mentality. This desire to belong can lead to horrific acts. The drive to serve the tribe without question, it results in the destruction of conscious ideals. The tribal vision clouds your identity if you only look at it from that lens. And without a conscious connectedness to the sense of individual growth, you project it onto external causes, like the black squares on Instagram, or, yeah. or, you know, the, the vaccine circle in your profile picture. Uh, it lowers your humanity and it lowers your vibrational frequency. And it, it causes you to go more into the other wolf, the reptilian brain, rather than the rational human brain. And that's what led to Jesus being condemned on the cross by his own people. That's what led to the Nazis and, and the horrific world war that we faced. So on an individual level, we're like buds on a tree, but on a human historic level, it's the trunk and the roots of the tree. As as you said, Carl, you said, they can go all the way to hell if we reject independent thinking and it's being called selfish or being canceled because they risk being ousted from a tribe. Mm -hmm. And that leads to cultish behavior. That leads to control. So so Shane, just on that point, because... When you talk about that, this makes me reflect back on, you know, some of the stuff we've been talking about with Nietzsche and Jung and so on. And do you think that, like, do you think this is where the where the the, the sense of the loss of meaning has 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 led to this? Because if you look at a recent census in Australia, forty four percent of people don't believe in any religion anymore. Now, I'm not saying religion is the be all and end all, but like what Nietzsche said about God is dead, and you know we have killed them, and there's just vacuum of meaning being pulled out and so people are latching on to the cancel culture the war culture or this intersectionality that Karen spoke about everybody wants to be the you know I'm the the black Asian gay transgender you know oppressed blah 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 but I go to Harvard at the same time like it's just this weird kind of <laughs> wait now you're at Harvard right so it's, it's this kind of weird thing I, I have to be like bang 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 down at this kind of corner of the of the earth and nobody knows my affliction or my pain or my suffering and no one can ever understand i'm special i'm the top of the you know the 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 pyramid of, of people of get, who are getting fucked and, that, and that's you know that's just the way it is but do you think like that people then in this absence or this vacuum are latching on to things like you know nearly worshiping the covid system if you want to call it that they're worshiping the vaccine they're worshiping the politician because i see it here in western australia we had a landslide election for a Labour Party, it was over 90% for the for the state premier, like a state governor. And people were like, this is brilliant. I'm like, no, this is actually scary. This is on the verge of totalitarian. This is a herd that goes one way. We have got nobody questioning anything. We we even saw here that our premier was in cahoots with the with the with the paper of the state, like as in the newspaper. And so our kind of version of um, you know, kind of like Rupert Murdoch in, in our state was colluding with the state premier in text messages that all came out about front page news. And so you see all this stuff happening and people are like, yeah, yeah, but he was just trying to get out a message. And I'm like, this is really, this is terrifying, right? And this is just one example in a state here in Western Australia with about, I don't know, two and a half million, three million people. And, and this was terrifying. But when you look behind it all, people are like the belief in science, the belief in a politician, the belief in a, a system, Nobody's talking about, you know, good nature stuff, the meaning. And and about 600 meters away from me, there's a Catholic church. And during, to your point about the COVID stuff, during that, that Catholic church got raided, for want of a better word, by the police. 
and came in during a service saying, why aren't people social distancing? Why aren't people wearing masks? You know, are you checking for vaccinations? That story actually made the news in in in, um, in America. Like, that is fascinating that we've gone that way. And so the question is, how much do you think where we've stripped out the meaning of our life has led us to latching on to these things in this kind of postmodern nihilistic way? Why do you think the Nazis had all the book burnings? Why do you think they purged all the intellectuals from society? And if, the, if they can't purge them, let's dig up some dirt on them. If we can't find any dirt, let's make shit up. Yeah. And hope it sticks like, like the Russia hoax and the peeing tape with Trump, right? Complete BS funded by Hillary Clinton, actually. But if you say you're a Trump supporter, based on the policies, you're considered a racist, a bigot. You have to be canceled. You have to remove, be removed from society. No one's going to like you. Goes back to Darren Brown, guys. I'm sure you've heard of Darren Brown. This uh, he's a British guy. The hypnotist. Illusionist. Illusionist, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. He, he's had these mind experiments, conversational hypnosis. Brilliant. One of those things is where people are sitting in a waiting room to go in, and this guy is sitting there first, and he's they hear a little noise and he stands up with his with his writing pad and sits down again and does that. And as more and more people come in, they just start doing that. They don't know why the hell they're doing that. They're just doing that anyway. So this group think where abstraction allows us to avoid our own inadequacies and rather than working on them, have this abstraction, I believe is what's causing a huge divide on an individual level, on a familial structures level, and therefore on a societal level. So mm. Anne Bedford Ulanov said it beautifully. She said the devil's trick is to lead us to let go of an evil that we can do something about to work for an abstract and idealized good that can never be realized. Mm. So it won't end. You'll be lost. Your sense of bearings, your moral compass is going to be shamed in, out of existence. And then they can create new paradigms for what is considered appropriate, what's considered moral, what's considered okay, what's considered not okay, what should be included, what should be banned from so-called civilized society. So it heads toward a totalitarian state when we don't have this kind of discourse and dialogue. And that's what terrifies me. The, the Prime Minister of New Zealand was on video the other day saying, she said, the government should be a source for all information. And I'm tearing my hair out saying, no, <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah as, if, as, if, as if she, like, who hasn't heard of George Orwell and just like, a, some, <laughs> it's like some people read George Orwell and thought it was like a horrific warning. And other people thought it was a fucking instruction manual. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. But it's like, but this is, but this is an example, though. Like I meant to say earlier on, like I know you're in Chicago, Shane, and this, I got really interested in after the. Because I, I lived in America for like four different times, and and I've traveled really? around, like Very yeah, and like like and in 2015 or 2016 was a really interesting time to live there. I lived there six or seven months, both years, because it was I got to see loads of the build up to the election, you know, and and a lot of the drama and all that crap. And I lived in Boston and San Francisco, but I traveled in like. In my, in my, in, in the various times I've lived in the US, I've been on like 38 of the lower 48. I've been all over the place because I was working at a job that involved truck driving. And, um, uh, so, so I, I've been in places like rural Idaho and Iowa and the like states and rural small towns in Texas and places that tourists would never go. Like, and like you, you mentioned, I, I, I found it then this whole notion of, you know, in the, in, in the, in the aftermath of the George Floyd stuff. The, this notion of white privilege and I and I, I kept hearing this phrase and I'm like anyone who's using that phrase hasn't seen these trailer park towns where everyone is white everyone is fucked up looking because there's no health service and the, the men maybe they're working in the trail in the truck stop if they're not there on heroin and the women are either in the truck stop working in the one of the truck stops either side of town or they're a prostitute and that's just like that's the whole, that's your options. And maybe if you're healthy enough, you can get out and join the army because that, that's the only way you can even get enough money together to leave the town. 
So it's like it, the, the notion just seemed so bizarre. And then when you actually look into the data, like you'd said, this sprung to mind when you were talking about like the, the, the facts in particular, especially with you're in Chicago, it's like, I, I then went digging a bit and I wrote this big essay a couple of years ago. And part of what I went down the rabbit hole on was the, the claims around police violence. Like I got so fascinated with that. I was like, oh, this seems, because I've had, I lived in America four times and across the first two times, I was at a lot of loose parties, right? And long story <laughs> short, multiple times, I've had guns pulled on me four times. Once I was working as a bouncer and then there was this, this Nazi lad basically pulled a gun on me. And the other three times were by cops and two of them involved parties. And they were so like I'm 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 about as wide as you can fucking be, and I've had guns pulled at me three times by cops. So it's like then when I was after that combination of that plus the the trips around all entirely white towns that's in that unbelievable shitholes, just the war like such bad like like it's like these people have no options in life. They're they have, they're, 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 they're it's so awful, and like there's nothing like there's no equivalent to it here in Ireland. There's no equivalent to the worst towns in America. There's no equivalent to it in Ireland. Like this, mm. the, the poorest, most downtrodden town in Ireland doesn't hold a candle to the equivalent in America, even though America is the richest country in the world. And part of it's because of geography, because nowhere in Ireland is that far away from anywhere else. Do you know? So maybe that's part of it. But, but anyway, so, but then you look at something like the, there was all, all the kind of crack around police violence. It's a fascinating aspect of the data that jumped out to me was that even using like the Washington Post data in, the t in 2019, there was 14, there was a thousand people killed by cops in 2019, if I remember the data correctly. Out of that roughly a thousand, about 50 of them were unarmed. And out of that 50, 14 were black. And out of the four, and then, so that's 28%. And, now, and of course, 13% of the population is black. So then if you just look at that level, you go, okay, racist, because 28% of the population 28% of the unarmed killings, black, and only 13% of the population are black. But then when you actually look at the interactions per police, per, the interactions, the death per interaction with police officers higher for white people by 25%. So it's like, and then you look at why, why is there more interactions of black people? And you look at the actual crime stats and you have in 2019 or 2018, the year before, because when I was looking at the data, I wasn't out for 2019 yet. There was, in 2018, 53.3% of the murder in America was done by black people because of gang violence. So you had one-eighth yeah. of the population doing one-eighth of the murder and 43.3% of weapons offenses. So it's like, those are two things that you cannot put a, you can't, you can't make those crimes up because there needs to be a dead body or there needs to be a weapon. Like you can have yeah. a cop planting a weapon or something, but the end of the day, so they're get people are getting killed. And so when you look at gang violence in Chicago, there was in 2019, 14 unarmed black people were killed in the whole of America by police. But there was three, I think it was 358 black people were murdered in Chicago alone in gang violence. And you didn't hear a peep about that from Black mm -hmm. Lives Matter. So like the, yeah. they, they, they didn't care about the, the, the black people that were being killed in gang violence, mostly by other black people, because that was an inconvenient truth. They instead were focusing on what was fitting the political narrative that facilitated the the story, the 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 the, 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 the what they wished was the case almost in a really dark way, and that just blew me away when I pulled it and I, I pulled that apart. It just melted me. I was like, "This do, is." Do, do you know what be interesting, Karen, is actually to replace those those terms, black and white people, or geographical locations would be to replace those with like football team names, Liverpool versus Manchester United, or, you know, uh, happened in grid A versus grid B. And just take the, the, the emotion of it from, the, from people's race and ask people then to look at the data. Because I think people interpret the data a lot different if that was the case. The problem is, to your point, is that there's so much emotion and a narrative getting pushed into it that nobody wants to look at it objectively. And I think Sam Harris had an academic on talking about this who published some work on it. I can't remember his name and he is African American. Roland Griffiths. Roland Griffiths, that's his name. And, and he got kicked got out of Harvard from because Harvard of it. From got, yeah. like, 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 it's to our point about, you know, free speech and inquiry into that and the scientific method and looking at stuff, you know, rationally and then also like emotionally as well. But like, it's, it's, it's absolutely 
like amazing and horrendous simultaneously that these things are happening. And like what you were saying, Shane, about being called an anti-vaxxer because you ask questions. I was the same last year. I was an anti-vaxxer. I can't believe you've got a PhD in science and you're an anti-vaxxer. I'm not an anti-vaxxer. I'm an anti-bullshit artist, I said. That's what I am. The government telling you what to do every minute of the day. And I need more information, like what you said, Shane, as well, the same thing. It's not that I'm a virologist or a medical doctor. I'm not claiming to be. But as a citizen, I want more information. But the minute you put up your hand these days against the herd in things like Black Lives Matter, vaccinations, these sacred cows, you are just absolutely shot down and pigeonholed away from the group. And if you don't have any meaning or purpose in your life, you are done. And I think if you're not a strong character, your life is very sad if you can't stand up to these groups and you can't be your own person. And unfortunately, or fortunately, I've never been able to be like that in my life. So there's been some will to power or some sort of spirit inside of me that's always made me question these things for good or for bad at my own detriment. But, you know, I'm going to die on my own little horse over here, rocking away, seeking the truth. I'm not against anything. I'm completely open to new ideas and I want to see what's happening and I want to learn things. I don't run with a specific group. I can't. You would look at me on a political spectrum. I would be considered far right on one one and one 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 uh, item and far left on the other. And people go, oh, I can't work you out. I said, I can't even work myself out. It's a journey. You can't be pigeonholed into these things. And so to, back to Karen's point about the data, it, there's too much emotion and, and pardon the pun, but black and white thinking on this. And it's yeah. it's it's really dangerous. It's it, it's yeah. scary. Oh. Right. And it's terrifying because you're not now segmented into, into two large groups. And as you said, these sacred cows, it's exactly what it is. They're looking at this as a new religious kind of bent toward this stuff, that it's untouchable. It's blasphemy if you go against what they're parroting. And I like that you produced some data, Karen, because I've been looking at the data for a long time when it comes to gun violence, for example, 85% of the homicides of African-Americans are by other African-Americans. And I'm not saying that they're more homicidal in general, but let's look at the underlying causes rather yeah. than just have a political yeah. statement. They, they talk about the, the mass shootings with automatic weapons or assault rifles over here. But in, when you look at the congressional testimony, they want to ban certain weapons from us. They can't even define what an assault rifle is, number one. And number two, every weekend in Chicago, there's around 40 to 50 people being shot every weekend, mm -hmm. many of those dying. Where's that on the news? It doesn't fit into the narrative. Now, when we look at the ratios, when we break them down, as you said, we don't need criminal justice reform. There's a reason why more of a certain demographic are filling up prisons and jails because they're committing more serious crimes. And when we ask the question why, there's a good argument to be made in terms of the direct correlation with the fact that in the African-American community or in the States, the single motherhood rate is around 74%. So where are these young men going to get validation? Where are they going to have healthy father figures? They're going to find them on the street. And good quality guys with good values aren't just hanging around the street. You want a quick buck? You want these fancy shoes? You want to be like their average or whatever? Yeah, yours are done. Steal this from the store. Sell mm -hmm. these drugs. And they get caught in a cycle of violence. These things are social issues that are not gun issues. It's like they, they want to ban certain magazines and, and rifles from law-abiding citizens like myself. So it's like saying, well, there's a lot of drunk driving accidents in Chicago. Let's take all the sober drivers off the road and let's just let, let's have the drunk people continue driving. Like, Criminals will find a way to own weapons. If you have strict gun laws in this country with over 300 million guns in circulation already, the only people you're going to be disarming are law-abiding citizens. So the whole gun issue really strikes, strikes a chord with me because I'm seeing the effects firsthand. But, those, but the, the attempts to change, like I think that the attempts to just blame the gun availability at, at in, in different gun law at the gun laws it's it's a it's a shallow solution to a deep problem like the problem is a lot more messier 
but it's but it's an attempt it's a, it's an attempt by politicians to tick certain boxes like i, I and i said I, I lived in boston which is some of massachusetts is some of the strictest gun laws in the states from my understanding and i still had a, a mate who could buy guns illegally no problem and he, he could buy even things like fragmentation grenades he just told me that he bought some grenades for the crack just so he could go out when he's out camping and just with his mates and i was like <laughs> What the fuck are you going to do with grenades, man? <laughs> and he was like, I don't know. I just like, I, fuck it. He had them. And, you know, he was buying some weed or something. And he was like, fuck it. I'll buy some grenades as well off this fella. I was like, and, and I was just like, oh my God. And it's like, when you have some oh. of the strictest gun laws in the country, in Massachusetts, and it's still possible for just a lad who's buying a, some weed to be able to get fragmentation grenades for the laugh. You're like, okay, the cat's out of the fucking bag here. Like, you're not mm -hmm. going to put the cat back in the bag. The two paces out of the tube, it's done. What, let's actually look, look at what are the actual underlying, what's the upstream causes here, do you know? And like you yeah. had pointed out, there's there's academics like um, there's Glenn Lowry and John McHorter who, and uh, Thomas Sowell. They're, they're like more conservative, tilted academics. But because of that, they just don't get much of a voice. Like John McHorter, a bit different. Like he got a job in the New York Times recently. But uh, Glenn Lowry and Thomas Sowell, get kind of pigeonholed as, oh, they're just right-wing cons conservative Christian or whatever, and they don't listen to them. They're just, you know, they're like Uncle Toms or whatever. They get insulted and stuff just because they don't fit the narrative as black men who are pointing out issues that are upstream of the violence, you know, rather than just blaming the the social issues or the, the, in the just the economic stuff. They're looking at, okay, what's culturally going on here that's like, like an, an example that that there's a, there's a writer called Coleman Hughes who writes brilliantly and has a great podcast on this stuff. And um, and he used an example where, um, actually, I, I can even give a better example, is uh, Dave Chappelle's comedy show from last year. This is even a better one, where he talked about there's a, a rapper called Little Baby or something. I can't remember what the rapper's name was. But this guy made an, an, a, an anti, a, a, he took the piss out of gay people or something on stage. And everyone lost their shit, big social media uproar, attempt to cancel him and everything. But it was like a year or two before this fella shot a person in a supermarket. No one gave a fuck. So it's like he could murder someone. He could shoot someone and kill him in a supermarket. And it's not a big deal. But then if he says a gay joke, he, say, he, he takes a piss out of gay people, all of a sudden he needs to be canceled. So it's like there's like a, a viewing of, there's this bizarre viewing of black people that's really, um, in the in in the kind of like more progressive zeitgeist, as if they're almost childish or primitive or something, and it's ah oh, if they do the violence thing, it's not their fault, you know, and it's just what they do. It's just because of the circumstances. It's like with this, it's like it's so denigrative, it's so demeaning of their human potential. That's racist. Yeah, it's like, racist it's as fuck. Like, like, yeah, that's super racist in my opinion. It, it goes back to even voter ID with the last election cycle. They were saying that states who required voter ID for people to vote, they were saying that those states are, are racist. So basically they were saying that the assumption is that African-Americans don't have IDs or can't obtain IDs, which is ludicrous, right? So that itself is, is more of a racist statement. The funny, funny side note, guys, I read up this article uh, actually today about this this little city that had a gun buyback program. You give us your guns, we'll give you $50, a gift mm. card. And this one dude decided to play the system. He said 3D printing. He 3D printed 62 <laughs> guns at $3 a pop. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so they had to take the guns. They took 62 guns, gave them over $3,000. So oh, that was a brilliant I know. That's like that so, show. Of, that's like that show. The wire, you know, and it says it's all in the game. You, you set the rules, you play the game. <laughs> but it's, it's an interesting one point. on like you mentioned when Ian mentioned Australia earlier on, and the the really hardcore COVID myopia that took place over there, much more even than here in Ireland. And uh, something that I I thought about in relation to there and the US is. Like there was like door to door stuff going on in parts of Australia where like mm. the Australian army were knocking on people's door to make sure that they were home. Yeah. And knowing what I know about, like you wouldn't be able to do that in America. It's oh like, no. Just because that's like built into the culture. The culture <laughs> is like the, 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 the second amendment being we, we have guns because of uh, tyranny. 
you know, the, to protect us from tyranny. Just like the fact that it's actually baked into the culture, like the first and second amendment is like, we can say what we want. We have to say what we want to protect our gun laws. We have gun laws to keep us allowing to say what we fucking want. You know, so like that, I just thought that was fascinating. I made a joke about it with Ian that like, if there wouldn't be, the army is not going to be knocking door to door in Texas, like, you know, to yeah. make sure yeah. you're home. The fucking <laughs> chance. <laughs> the, the Second Amendment is the only amendment where they, the founding father said, shall not be infringed. But they've already started infringing upon it and limiting magazines and, and the kinds of guns you can own and having elaborate background checks and concealed carry permits and all these things to make it harder and harder for law-abiding citizens not to arm themselves. But yes, I 100% agree with you. And also not just the the social aspect that results in crime surges, but also the local prosecutors in these cities like Chicago, LA, San Fran, New York. San Fran in particular. They- I lived in San Fran. Fuck me, that place is nuts. Like even six years ago, it was nuts. Not to mind now, yeah. I've heard about this. Yeah. You, I mean, sure, you've sure, 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 seen videos, people going into stores, taking whatever they want, yeah, leaving, yeah. because the prosecutors are not prosecuting these crimes. And so, if they're not prosecuting crimes, if they have cash and release, if they have cashless bail, of course people are going to commit crimes with Im- impunity because you can do whatever you want, take whatever you want. And you're, you're armed, but the legal c- law-abiding citizens are not armed. And so it's it's the prosecutors, it's it's the, the culture, and it's the lack of this conversation, as you rightly said. But it's going gonna, it's gonna to spin out of control, Shane, because you know people only take that for so long. People like people won't sit back and be robbed and abused. People, the, the people who are generally, like you said, law-abiding citizens going about their day, don't want any violence, want to have a good day. You keep doing that to those people. It's like what the Peterson thing said, Jordan Peterson. See what weak men are capable of. See, the, see when the meek become not so meek and mild and see what to do. Because the, it'll just unleash. And what you'll see then, I think, in the future in America is you'll see people coming in to rob like a pair of, uh, you know, trainers out of a store and, and maybe an iPad for a $1,000. And then what's going to happen is some shop owner is going to start blasting people out the door with shotguns and going, I'm sick of getting robbed. I'm sick of getting beaten up. And they're going to start shooting people. Or they're going to start like, they are, they're going to start killing people. Can you imagine, you think, take the example of your own house. Imagine your house was getting robbed once a week. I think after about two or three weeks, you'd be like, that's enough. I'm going to start throwing knives at these people. I'm going to start doing everything. People people will not be, people will only take, I don't care who you are, there's a certain limit to the amount of bullying, so to speak, that you can take before people react. And then when it reacts like that, you're going to get yourself into this lawless society. And it's all in the the whole kind of, you know, the, the whole religion of, the, of worshiping the woke God and what's allowed. It's a complete bullshit. What we need to do is move back behind it and look at the root causes. There's the things like you touched on there, Shane. There's not just the guns as well, right? We can look at those as a category, whatever people's you know opinion is on those. But there's a whole structure about why are these things happening? What's happened to these social demographic uh, groups? The absence of fathers, I think, is a massive factor. It's a massive factor in all communities in today's world where, you know, Families are working like, you know, 60 hours a week, mother and father, latchkey kids. There's no structure. It's across all groups. And and men aren't being initiated. They aren't being coached and trained and, and brought up. And, you know, it leads to all these negative uh, downstream factors as well. So we're having this, I think this whole coming back full circle in our conversation, this whole meaning crisis is affecting lots of parts of our community across every social um, economic group and every demographic. And we're all going to miss out on it. And I think if we don't start working on ourselves, it's a bit like the Buddhism thing. You know, we're not trying to change the world. We're trying to, if we all just work on ourselves, everybody's working on ourselves. So the whole world will move forward as opposed to one or two or a group of woke people trying to change everybody. That's not going to happen. Work on yourself, improve yourself, and we'll all can move forward. But let's start looking at the root causes, not looking at the symptoms. Let's actually knuckle down and do some long-term good work instead of putting a band-aid on everything we see in the world. And this is what infuriates me. It's these, you know, these little, you know, little blips in the, in the ratings that people want from politicians or groups or news stories, and it's all feel good. But nothing's tangible. It's like the Black Lives Matter thing with Formula One. Yeah, they all took a knee before every race. But I never saw anything articulated, and even some of the commentators said, what was the problem? What are we going to do? What are the resources? How are we going to do it? How are we going to measure it? And how are we going to follow up? Like having a business plan approach to it. 
No, it's all about virtue signaling. It's all about wearing the T-shirt. Point, but I shame made the point earlier on, like that, I remember wherever that quote was from, the objective from the activists largely isn't to address a problem. It's, yeah. it's cosmic justice. It's an unreachable justice. It's a, it's a game to perpetuate for its own sake. It's yeah. not about achieving a solution. Because yeah. if it was, they give. Because if it was about achieving a solution, they give way more of a fuck about Chicago than they would about exactly. Like there'd be a proportionate amount of energy put towards gang violence that there would be toward unarmed police shootings. It'd be this. There'd be a pro, not that you wouldn't care about unarmed police shootings. So that means obviously there's things to be addressed all over the place. But if you only have if you only have a limited amount of resources, you'd allot the resources proportionately to where they were needed. But that's not what's taking place. Because it's not about it's not about seeking solutions. It's about perpetuating a game of aspiring victimhood. Exactly right. Because the strength of their manipulation depends on the level of conviction and the force of the denial on the other side. So if we don't have this dialogue on an individual level with our shadows, with with the unknown, with the discomfort we cannot affect change in our families or neighbors or the next generation or in society as a whole. So the beautiful thing about this to me is how it, from the individual to the social and vice versa, above and below, is all consistent. These motifs and symbols and patterns and archetypes keep repeating throughout our history. We've seen this happen before and things come back around and things devolve and there are world wars. And people say, can you believe how bad it is? It's the worst it's ever been. No, talk to people who've been through world wars and civil wars, and they'll tell you that it was much worse or the Black Plague. Mm -hmm. So it's not all bad. It's not all good, right? It's doing our own individual work and taking that responsibility because with great freedom comes great responsibility. I think Victor Frankl said that. And you you mentioned Rumi earlier on. He's got one of the... I haven't read any Rumi at all, none except the odd quote here or there, but there's a friend of mine that sent me a Rumi quote a couple of years ago. It was, um, it was something like, um, yesterday I was clever and I tried to change the world, but today I was wise, so I tried to change myself. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. I love Rumi and I give uh, a copy of his poem, The Guest House, to a lot of my patients as well. It's mm. about rather than avoiding or not wanting to face suffering ask yourself, well, what can this teach me? What is this doing for you? Carl Jung spoke about that as well. He'd, he'd do dream analysis. I do some dream analysis with certain patients as well. And he'd say, well, what is this teaching me? He'd do active imagination. What is this teaching me? It's okay to experience one thing, but then what are you going to learn from that experience? And all of us can tap into our subconscious. So even the collective unconscious, if we practice it, and something I've begun to practice recently with some really strange ongoing discoveries, I might add. Cool. There, there was actually, there was something uh, I meant to ask you about earlier on. I really liked the phrase and I wanted to, to if, if you were willing to unpack it a bit, was you use the phrase uh, co-creators, that we are co-creators. Would you, what, 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 what did you, do you mean by that? And would you mind explaining a bit? Because I, I thought it was a fact, it just caught me, that phrase caught me. Yeah, so for me, being co-creators, when the Bible says God made us in his image and likeness, in spirituality, you talk about the presence of God within each one of us. When we talk about it in the medical world, we talk about, well, is there energy? Is there soul? Why is it certain near-death experiences have these transcendent experiences universally across cultures, religions? What does it mean for us? So for, for me to be a co-creator is to be able to affect change in our own lives. So we may have free will, but there's innate patterns of behavior and experience that we didn't have any control over for generations. So in psychology, they call it generational trauma. I call it generational learning. Uh, they've done experiments on rats. If a rat is given electric shock and then it's separate, has a rat baby and they're separated at birth, the rat babies know to avoid that stimulus. How do they know? No one taught them epigenetics. So we may have a set of DNA, 
but we can impact its expression through our lifestyle and our choices. That's what epigenetics is. So essentially, God's code within us can shift and change based on our actions along this journey on an individual level, on a medical level. That's fact. On a higher level, I go back to the Bible again. Think about the book of Job and how God kind of had to face his own injustices that he had perpetuated upon Job. And also look at Abraham, right? Abraham begged God not to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah as good people would also be murdered along with the bad. Then God tells Abraham, well, kill Isaac. After knowing that his wife was barren for years and they became elderly parents, he was going to do that and then God stopped him. So it kind of reflects in God's conflicted nature, perhaps. And this anticipates that, you know, God became man. Jesus was, was a physical representation of God. This maps onto that in Christianity and the idea that human beings play a role in the divine drama that's also found in Gnosticism. It's found in elsewhere in other cultures and philosophies. So in that way, we are co-creators of our own journey in this life. And perhaps through the right kind of prayer and the right kind of penance, we might be able to influence God on a, on a larger basis. And therein lies the hope of salvation for each one of us. Hope, doing our bit, and then hoping for the best. It's like that. I, liked, I, like, I, I love coming back to that uh, the Gandhi sentiment, but he got it from Tolstoy, which is like this, there's also no be the change you'd like to see in the world. That then he got that Leo Tolstoy, uh, who we Ian have talked about a lot recently. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, I really yeah, I just like read that. that book, A Confession by Leo Tolstoy, it was very good. But it's interesting, like Karen, you said about Leo Tolstoy, and you talk about you talk about epigenetics, Shane. It's also, I don't know what you would call it, about future projection and how people are influenced. You look at Leo Tolstoy influenced Gandhi, but Gandhi influenced Martin Luther King, and Martin Luther King influences a lot of people as well. And it's really interesting because if you look at like Martin Luther King, I read that book uh, about love thy enemy um, this year as well. That's, uh, that's a, a, tender, a tender heart, a tough mind and a tender heart. It was called, uh, yeah, right? yeah. That's what it's called. It's not, yeah. not it's but it, really it, nice. A small the little book. Lovely. Yeah. The sentiment is about like love and thy enemy, but it's, um, it's, it's a, it's a great, it's a great, like to see how the, the, the kind of the three of them overlapped in these different areas. But, you know, coming back to what we spoke about, I, I don't know who was recently was talking about Martin Luther King, like inspiring Black Lives Matter and so on. And I'm like, whoa, whoa. If you took Martin Luther King today and placed him beside you, he would be probably in the same camp as Trump. People are like, what? I said, he taught, he spoke about having values of like wearing a suit. He was very much like a Jordan Peterson or a Trump wearing a suit, going to college, educating You can't put Jordan Peterson and Trump in the same... No, but seriously, if you did, like if, yeah. you, if you actually sit down and, and take the emotion of it, the three of them would be similar in terms of like getting after it, making a plan, doing something worthwhile, you know, you change your circumstances. They actually have more in common than people think. And people think that Martin Luther King would have been this crazy Democrat. I don't know what you think, Shane, but I think he would have been like a far right Republican in today's work. I think so. I think yeah. society as a whole has moved far left. And anyone considered moderate or even just cynical is considered a, an extremist. Ronald Reagan said it well. He said, the scariest words that you could hear are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And Reagan used to be a Democrat originally. When he was yeah. an actor, he was a Democrat. And then he actually turned to the, the turned to the dark side, so to speak. Yeah. Um, we are coming towards the end. I am mindful of your time, Shane. It is a Friday evening. I know you, I know you have parties to be and pe people <laughs> to host probably. Um, and you want to get into you want to get into you want to get into the shadow part of the day. Um, and Karen is deep in the shadow. Um, Karen, do you have any final questions or comments for Shane? There's definitely some other kinds of worms I could open, but I'm <laughs> conscious of time, so I, I won't. I'm I re just a, just that I'm really appreciative of the conversation. It was very, very, very enjoyable, and I'm looking forward to listening back to it. So thanks yeah. very much for coming on, Shane. Thank you, guys. It's been a pleasure being here. I've I've learned and heard so many new things as well. Um, I definitely want to know what is on your bookshelves so I can read those books as well. 
it's we could go on and on and i'm just grateful for this opportunity and hope to talk to you guys again soon sometime no it's great thanks very much and i wanted to say what yeah. i got up from karen as well really appreciate it um we'll yeah. wrap it up even, there. even a, a fascinating chat for another time could be specifically zoning in on the religion and science like the 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 supposed conflict and uh, that that particularly is would be fascinating i think to chat about because the 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 role that the the, the very simplistic view that that i would have had around the, the christian the catholic church and science but even like just having these misunderstandings of what even went on with galileo and and I, anyway but i kind of worms with that in particular could be a fascinating just kind of the where science meets its edge and where what where where they cross over but where they can't ever cross over that kind of where religion and science that relationship between the two i think could be a fact i love to have that chat in particular because obviously with your with your particular domain as well and our interests as well so if you're up for if you're up for having that i think that would be a great chat i think so I, the foundational element is you're comparing we tend to compare apples and zucchini okay it's <laughs> i <laughs> I think about the the Bible touching at a very powerful universal unconsciousness, and I look at the unconscious mind as a quantum computer, and we're trying to make sense of things through religion using a binary computer. Our rational minds they don't really gel well together. They can overlap in certain aspects, and that's what Carl Jung sought to do. He sought to create sculptures and paintings, the Red Book, of his unconscious, what I call quantum experiences. So how do you take the, the learnings from our universal consciousness and our his history as human beings and then have it translate into something meaningful and tangible rather than mm. dismiss everything and start from a very infantile point of mm. view, which is our rational mind and dismissing anything that isn't proven as bullshit. That's mm. that's far removed from what true science should be about. Mm. Excellent. Yeah, there's, there's a, that's our next chat, definitely. Yes, I, I, I have to hold myself back here because I'm actually just finished. <laughs> I just I just finished an essay earlier on and sent it off to a friend and said or to friends yes and, and got some feedback and sent it off to a friend today for some more feedback. So like this is the topic. This is like the edge where science ends and where the rational has to where the rational meets its edge. So I like, was only a, literally an essay I finished today. So it's, it's it's very I could I could I could I could go on all night about this, but I, I'll, <laughs> that's our next chat. Please send it over to me. I'd love to read it. Cool. I will do. Will do. Thank you.